Good morning. I'd like to thank Amy Asbeck and Diana Milowitz for the opportunity to speak to you today on the topic of chronic dissection. As you've heard from Morale and Shireen, who've spoken about acute dissection, my task is to talk to you about chronic dissection and how we treat it. But as a review, we all know that aortic dissection, there's a flap that is created with a tear leading to a true and a false lumen. And this is what leads to all the complications related to aortic dissection. In the acute setting, we classify dissection as either those involving the ascending aorta, which is type A dissection, and those not involving the ascending aorta, which is type B dissection. And those involving the ascending require emergent surgery, and those in involving the descending will require either endovascular or medical treatment. What's important is that the location and the timing will help determine how we manage this. So what does chronic mean? Well, we know what acute is, which is anything less than 14 days, or even hyperacute, which is less than 24 hours. And in general, these, these situations need emergent or urgent surgery or interventions. And why, as you can see here in the ace in the aorta, which is very thin from the dissection, can rupture and dissect and lead to death very quickly. This is a case of chronic dissection in the descending thoracic aorta. In contradistinction to acute dissection, the flap with chronic dissection is much thicker, but this leads to a false channel and thins out the wall leading to aneurysms. So this can also become a problem with uh, rupture and redissection. So what is chronic? Chronic is really anything greater than 90 days by the new classification scheme. And again, there's a new uh, class subclassification so called subacute, which is 15 to 90 days. Why that becomes as important is the fact that that flap may still be able to heal and remodel with endovascular treatment. So that's why that becomes uh, important because the timing of that may be optimal during that subacute phase. But what I'm going to focus really on is chronic dissection. We know John Ritter passed away in 2003 from acute type A dissection. And his wife, Amy Yazbek, has done a great job over the past 17 years educating the world on aortic dissection and started the John Ritter Foundation for Aortic Health. And through this uh, process, she's educated many of us through uh, that website and through educational conferences just like this. We, we know that John Ritter was a, a, a very talented actor and had a number of very popular shows. And his last one was Eight Simple Rules. And Ms. Yazbek took that and started Ritter Rules for Aortic Dissection. Well, on that same line of thinking, I'm going to give you the Ritter's Rules for Chronic Dissection. And it starts with accepting that aortic dissection is a lifelong condition, even when you're in the chronic state. We know that even if you are repaired in a type A dissection, so the ascending aorta is replaced, you still have a descending and thoracal dama aorta, which will likely have dissection and will need to be followed closely. It's something like diabetes and hypertension, a lifelong condition that needs to be followed, regardless of whether you're repaired on the ascending or not. We know that the late intervention rate, even after you've had an ascending aortic repair from type A dissection, can be as high as 10 to 25%. Aneurysmal dilatation can be about one millimeter per year. So we know that the wall is weak and there's a risk for that to dilate and continue to form an aneurysm that can lead to rupture. So that becomes very important in the natural history. And for this reason, surveillance is key. So number two, Ritter rule, Surveillance becomes the key for a lot of these patients in the long chronic state. This is an important paper that was published recently that talks about the importance of imaging surveillance. And what I want to point out to you here is that radiographic adverse events and the need for surgery was highest between 6 to 12 months after the initial dissection. But importantly, Notice that those risks do not decrease dramatically even beyond five to six years. So the point here is even though the peak is that first year, uh, there is still a risk of finding complications or needing an intervention after the initial dissection. And so that's why surveillance becomes very important. And 
as important as the fact that patients that did not have imaging had a lower survival rate than those that did. This just goes to the fact that while you're following it, you can actually intervene to prevent complications of rupture and redissection and death. How do we survey in the chronic state, CT scan or MRI on a yearly basis at least after that first year? An echocardiogram is used to look at the ascending aorta and aortic root. But again, within that first year, you need to follow it probably a little more closely every three to six months. And if everything remains stable, then you can follow it on an annual basis. Surveillance, surveillance improves survival. Number three, blood pressure control is not just for the birds. Uh, going back to the Canadian uh, turkey farms, it was very interesting. In 1952, there was an interesting paper in which it was identified that turkeys have high blood pressure. And if turkeys were startled, that pressure would go up and the turkeys would die of dissected aortas. Then in the late 50s, they realized by treating the turkeys with reserpine, which is a medication that lowers the blood pressure as well as lowers that impulse pressure of the heart of the turkey, you can improve the crop survival of turkeys. So this actually became the basis of how we treat dissection in trying to reduce that pulse pressure, uh, that impulse force of the heart. And that's why we use beta block. So having said that, this was an interesting study published a few years ago from the group of WashU, who noted in patients with repair type A dissection, if you treated them with beta blockers, the ones without beta blockers did not survive as long. Now there's a lot of issues in general with the study, but I thought it was very interesting to see that patients who were followed, who had good surveillance, who were on beta blockers, uh, survived longer than those who didn't in this subgroup of patients. And as well as that, patients who had a blood pressure less than 140 also did well. So this becomes the basis of our guidelines for the management of these patients in the chronic setting with regards to blood pressure management. Number four, prepare electively for an intervention. So as a patient with an acute aortic dissection that has now survived, uh, it's very important that there's always that risk of requiring a future intervention, and you must always be prepared for that. As a surgeon, we weigh the risk and benefits of surgery versus waiting for the patient. Now, understanding that the operative mortality in the elective state is about 1% to 2%. So even though it's not zero, it's much lower than if we have to do an intervention in an emergency state, which is as high as 20 to 50%. So obviously, we want to try to do things on an elective basis before they become a problem. Surgery is still a big deal, though. Once you open up a patient, there's a lot of recovery that's required for that patient. But in general, being prepared for that is, is really the most important thing. And as, as such, uh, prior to an elective procedure, you need to take care of yourself as a patient. You need to prepare mentally. And it's like training for a marathon. It's best to be in good shape before you undergo any kind of major intervention. Number five, open and not or endovascular repair became, becomes the mainstay of treatment uh, for us as surgeons. There is an endovascular revolution and endovascular stenting has, uh, has provided a minimally evasive approach for many kinds of aneurysms and sections that we treat now. This is describing a stent graft that's not approved yet for the ascending aorta, but you can see a lot of the work that's been done over the past five years, especially trying to advance the field with endovascular technologies for the aorta. But the reality is standard open repair becomes really a gold standard for especially the proximal aorta. Uh, we know that doing an open repair, although much more invasive, does provide durability for a patient. So every patient needs to be individualized in terms of what kind of treatment you're going to offer the patient. But it's never a competition between open versus endovascular. They're more complementary in my mind. And we need to think of open and endovascular techniques as being tools in the armamentarium of the interventionalist and the surgeon. I use this individualized standard for aneurysm treatment using a flap uh, 
sort of a name in which there's frailty, life expectancy, anatomy, and pathology. And depending on the type of patient you are counseling for an intervention, and depending on these conditions, will help you decide whether to do an open or an endovascular procedure. Obviously, open is going to be much more durable than an endovascular procedure. And as such, we tend to recommend open repairs for younger patients who have uh, uh, good life expectancies and who are fairly fit. Uh, endovascular treatments in general will be reserved for patients who have shorter life expectancy, less fit uh, for interventions, especially patients uh, who are older, you know, in their 70s and 80s, will probably benefit from endovascular treatments. But dissection and chronic dissection uh, has a lot of technology uh, and techniques that have improved outcomes with endovascular for uh, chronic dissection patients. Number six, choose wisely. You know, as, as a patient, it's very important to, to understand what your disease process is and to really own your disease. Uh, but it's also important to make sure that your aortic team the folks that are managing you act like a team that's designated and dedicated to treating patients with aorta, uh, aortic diseases. Because what's most important, obviously, is the patient needs to be in the center. But there are a lot of facets in caring for these patients that become very important to, to make sure the patient has a good outcome. And so, you know, my advice to uh, my patients in, in general uh, is making sure that they uh, know that the group that they are seeking medical attention to from actually has uh, a good uh, multidisciplinary team approach to uh, caring for them. Uh, this is one of our multidisciplinary conferences that we hold on a monthly basis to discuss very complex cases uh, of management of the order that includes all those uh, groups that were mentioned on the previous slide. Number seven, take control. Mm -hmm and own your disease. It's very easy to let aortic dissection, especially in the chronic state, absorb you, imprison you as a patient because you're so fearful of all the potential complications. But uh, it's at this point that a person has survived through the acute setting, now is in the chronic setting, can take control, can own the disease, you know, and in, in essence, uh, prepare for this elective procedure if it's gonna be required in the future. So what to expect, you know, as a patient, we educate them that, you know, operations can be painful. Uh, there could be localized uh, uh, recurrence of, of pain depending on the location of the incision. There are always subtle, subtle changes that can occur with these patients. Uh, medication changes depending on the blood pressure uh, after an operation. There are dietary changes and obviously regularity. Can, can be altered by any of these large operations. And these large operations may take up to three months to feel normal. So having an expectation uh, prior to an intervention becomes real important. Uh, but in essence, you need to live your life. Uh, there's not a lot of data on the activity. AHA, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology put out you know, some recommendations on activities, but in general, there's there's not a lot of objective data on this topic. And so in general, I, I recommend to the patients just to avoid heavy straining for the most part. Uh, uh, putting a, a rec requirement on lifting can be difficult because every patient can be different. And, and so a simple advice to avoid heavy straining for long periods of time is, is probably very reasonable. But patients can walk, jog, swim, bicycle, you know, anything within reason on a leisurely pace uh, is probably reasonable. And patients can continue personal relationships. Uh, that's not really an issue. This was the guidelines put out by the ACC and American Heart. And what you need to take note of is the activities on the top upper right corner uh, really are those that are highest intensity and maybe the ones that you should try to avoid if you do have a history of aneurysms or dissection. But again, there's not a lot of data on this topic, and I know a number of groups across the country are trying to characterize this uh, more uh, specifically. Knowledge becomes really uh, your power as a patient with chronic aortic dissection. It's important to try to keep a notebook, uh, make a list of questions, and ask your healthcare provider uh, so you're aware of all these issues. 
you got to feel comfortable, especially if you're going to have an operation before you leave that visit with the, the surgeon, because again, uh, you want to own your disease. And number eight is to share your story. Uh, I encourage patients to enroll in research studies because that's how we can expand our knowledge base for uh, aortic dissection in general. And also sharing your story allows you to uh, share your experiences with others who may not have had uh, what you've gone through uh, in, in the past. Uh, there are a lot of organizations out there that uh, provide mechanisms uh, both on the web uh, uh, and, and in person, personal meetings to try to share these experiences. Uh, this is the John Ritter Foundation uh, Facebook uh, site, uh, which allows people to share their experiences with each other. Uh, this is one of the patient groups that uh, we had uh, started in the past to try to learn about what patients are going through. And Dr. Shreen Shalhoub has NIH funding to look at this with type B dissection. And the internet is a very powerful tool with regards to social networking. And there are a number of websites and patient uh, YouTube videos that I refer my patients to look at uh, before they undergo an operation. And I just think this body of knowledge continues to increase, uh, but uh, it gives patients a, a good opportunity to really understand and own their disease. So in the end, Ritter's rules for chronic dissection include accepting that aortic dissection is a lifelong condition. Surveillance really is the key to improve survival. Blood pressure control is very important. It's not just for the birds. Patients need to prepare electively for an intervention and be prepared as if they're training for a marathon, knowing that that could happen in the future. As surgeons, we know that open and endovascular are tools in our armamentarium, but need to individualize patients for the best treatment in chronic dissection. It's important for patients and physicians to choose wisely in terms of uh, where they refer their patients and making sure that uh, each patient uh, has the best opportunity for a good outcome. As a patient, it's important to take control, own your disease, uh, don't let the disease control you. And then in the end, enroll in study, share your story with others because you have uh, no idea how much you can help a patient, another patient in your situation by just sharing your story. And so with that, uh, again, my advice is to control your life. Don't let aortic dissection control you. And with that, I again thank uh, Amy Yazbek and Dinah Milowitz for the opportunity to talk to you on chronic dissection. Thank you.